morning brewery life jasper here um so today is another brew day on our brew house today i want to talk about kind of wort separation wort collection and boiling um some other big responsibilities that the brewery brew house is responsible for um we're going to be doing a little experiment today with reiterated mashing um so that might be a little crazy but we're gonna all shoot this uh live for you guys and hopefully you enjoy it. Cheers. So mashing is done and we're about to crack our uh, bottom valve and start wort separation right now. Um, <clears throat> the wort is really viscous and thick and high play-doh so you want to start it very slow just by kind of cracking this bottom valve. You can see the chunkies starting to what's settled down starting to move through this system. Um, and yeah, it's better just to start slow and settle that bed than start too fast and just instantly co uh, collapse that bed. So we're going to drain this out until this starts running pretty clear. And then we'll go into uh, Vorloffing, putting these chunkies uh, back on top of the grain bed. bed. But that's how you just first start opening um, your wart separation bottom valve of your mash tun. Cheers. We just started Vorloffing, so we had enough volume in that kettle to bring it from the kettle back on top of the grain bed. Um, this also helps settle that grain bed. Any of that um, under screen mash water that wasn't touching the grain, we're putting back on top of the grain. We're also getting the grain husks out of here, clearing it up a little bit. This process usually happens for about 15 minutes um, until we shut it off. So it's going from the kettle on top of the grain bed. You can look in here and see how it's going gently down the sidewall back into the mash tun. And that's our Vorloffing. So we've just started sparging. Before the sparging process, uh, you also you want to take your first runnings, gravity check and pH. Uh, so this uh, sparging process is just bringing fresh hot water on top of uh, the grain bed to rinse out those sugars of the grain bed. You can tell when you want to sparge by once that volume in your mash tun starts showing the first little signs of the grain islands. Um, or if you could pick up a little grain and it stays out of the water, that's a good level to start at. Too much water and that water is going to be too heavy pressing down on the grain bed or too little it's going to dry out the grain bed, start sucking away from the sides of the mash tun you'll see a gap on the side of the mash tun so it's kind of a, a brewer's balance getting the right runoff and sparge at the same time during the sparging time you're going to be wanting to check the gravity and the ph as well as your sparge volume and your kettle volume and keeping all those variables um, acceptable as you fill up that fill up that kettle uh, you can also speed up this process the longer that sparging has ran on um, the less viscous that sugar water is in here and you can slowly speed up opening that bottom mash tun valve a uh, little more speeding that up and uh, so if you can look right here it looks like we're sparging at about 170 degrees um, I like 168 to 170 might be a tick high but we're right in the, we're right in the zone that that heating up helps slow down that enzyme action um, it just makes it less viscous, so uh, with Darcy's Law, it'll move through that filtration grain bed easier. So that's a quick, uh, quick look at our sparging process. So that's the sparge going. You can see how there's that first island there. Um, and that's kind of when you look at the gr good water level to start sparging. What's up, guys? So I wouldn't recommend this, but we're doing this as an experiment. We're using our uh, sweet wort we collected and we're using it as our mash water for a second mashing, reiterated mashing. Um, kind of, I don't know, it's just kind of an experiment to get higher Play-Doh beer without using exogenous sugars like dextrose or anything like that. So yeah, this is our experiment we're kind of working with today. Um, go ahead and check it out. So we have, we have a little bit of an idea what to expect, but not a, not a great idea. 
So I'll let you know how this goes. Cheers. So our kettle's about halfway, two thirds of the way full, and we just flipped on our uh, direct fire burner in our kettle. If you wanna look in there. Um, it's important to turn on your kettle before it's all the way full. This saves a lot of time on that boiling process. Um, so you don't have to wait around to let it boil. Um, so we're just gonna start, we're just gonna finish filling up our kettle. We shut our sparge volume off about a barrel early. Um, some gets left in the grain. You just go for that sparge volume you're looking for and fill up your kettle um, to its volume, making sure your uh, gravity and your pHs all stay within an acceptable acceptable range. Um, you want to take last runnings and then once your kettle full, your pre-boil Play-Doh and uh, pH of, uh, of the kettle as well. But that kind of rounds out how we get our sweet wort separated from our grain and how we get our sweet wort um, filled up in our kettle. And it looks like we got a boil. Sorry, that's hard to see. All right, guys, so the boil. Uh, beer is the hardest alcohol to make, unlike wine, mead, cider. You, really, you have to boil it, really energy intensive. Um, spirits you also have to boil, but you don't have to worry about sanitation. You don't have to worry about carbonation. So that's why beer is known to be the hardest alcohol to make. Um, so brewers beware, get out now if you can. Uh, so why do we boil? Why do brewers boil? Um, this is something you need to think about and have some ideas down. Um, but I'll list off a few reasons. Um, um, of why we boil the beer. So I memorized it by this CIP. The first reason is uh, volatile, drive off DMS aroma and other aromas, drive off those unwanted aromas, happens in the boil. Um, isomerization of those hop alpha acids, making a desirable bitterness from our hops because of the boil. Um, sterilization, uh, killing all the microbes in here. Boiling the beer makes it um, sterile, so we can add a single yeast and it ferments great. Concentration, so during uh, this boil you drive off water, evaporate water, uh, raising the play-doh of, uh, of the beer of the wort and concentrating it. Uh, let's see else, inactivation of enzymes in the mash. So all those mash enzymes that I was talking about, this boil destroys them all kind of solidifies that malt profile of your beer. And uh, precipitation. We want to get out those polyphenols, that hot break that happens that you try to remove with the whirlpool. The precipitation uh, also happens because of the boil and a reason that we boil. Melanoidin compounds are formed uh, for some color and flavor. pH is also lowered in the boil. So those are all a bunch of reasons why uh, brewers of beer go through all this uh, energy intensive process of boiling. So kettles can boil by electric heating elements, uh, natural gas or direct fire, and uh, steam. So those heating elements on my old kettle were immersion, actually sitting in the liquid. Uh, uh, sorry, steam and natural gas. The burners happen in the firebox. Uh, steam can happen on jackets or a calandria. So calandria is something uh, that's nice to be familiar with. It's actually like a heat exchanger that sits inside the kettle, taking up kettle space, but super efficient because it's inside the kettle touching everything. Um, just a heat exchanger way to boil, boil, the, boil the wort. You can have an external calandria as well, a calandria kind of outside of the kettle that's that's able to boil two kettles at the same time. So another wild system, wild system to think about. But those are a few reasons why us brewers like to boil beer, and that's what's going on here. So after we boil this beer, uh, we're gonna whirlpool it, and I'll show you that process. All right guys, now that boiling's done, our last step in the brew house here before uh, knocking out and cooling is to whirlpool it. Try to get all the, um, protein or that hot break to the center so we can knock out clear wort. 
Um, we'll run the pump for a couple minutes, just turning it on while that pump is running. I also like to, with a paddle, help the top of uh, the kettle get in the whirlpool just with a few, with a few strokes like this. We'll let that pump run for three minutes or so, and then we'll do a 20 minute rest. Um, you don't want to run the pump too long because it'll break up that protein that we're trying to leave whole and you don't want it to rest for very long because this temperature is enough to make the precursor to DMS, SMM, but not enough to volatize DMS and drive it off so you don't want to leave it too long. Germans uh, or some people will also cool this beer instantly to about 85 degrees Celsius before they whirlpool just for DMS reasons. But that's the look at the Whirlpool. We'll get going uh, before knockout. Cheers. Well, just got done knocking out the reiterated mash for the first time. This is no exogenous sugars and a one hour boil. Um, looked like it got us where we wanted to be. Maybe I'll keep experimenting with it. Cheers. So that does it for us today with our wort separation and our wort boiling. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. If you did, smash that thumbs up. Until next time, keep drinking. Cheers.